Hello, everyone, and welcome to part two in the Institute for Local Self-Reliance's Scaling Up Community Composting webinar series, uh, Scaling Up Local Circular Composting. I am your host and moderator today, Clarissa Libertelli. I'm the coordinator of the Community Composter Coalition with the Institute for Local Self-Reliance's Composting for Community Initiative. And I'm joined today by our initiative director, Brenda Platt, who's going to be doing the tech support for us today. So thank you, Brenda. Uh, we have some great presenters lined up for you today. J.D. Hill from our city, Michael Martinez of LA Compost, Marissa D. Dominicus from Earth Matter, and Charlie Byrer from Earth Matter as well. Um, and I'll get into their uh, bios a little bit more right before I introduce them as speakers. But first, I wanted to say a few words about the work that ILSR does to promote community composting. We have a variety of different resources, um, including these webinars, but also we have infographics, we have a training program, we have policy resources. Um, we also have a coalition of community composters that I coordinate. It um, has over 300 members from the US and abroad. Uh, and we are going to be having a forum in Cleveland this year in person. And Brenda is going to drop a link in the chat if you would like to donate to our scholarship fund to get people with financial aid to the forum, um, because that is a big priority for us. And we also have a podcast and uh, a whole bunch of webinars on our website that the link will also be in the chat for those. Uh, the latest series that we did was on government support for community composting. So that's probably of interest to many of you. And just to clarify that today, we we love composting across the board, but we're really about promoting small scale decentralized community composting as opposed to the more industrial centralized composting that doesn't keep all of the benefits of compost use in the compost process in local communities. Um, the first webinar in this series was scaling up mission driven community composting. So that was a little bit more focusing on how when you're growing your operation, do you keep that community, uh, those community values in mind and stay true to that original mission of community composting. And today we're a little more focused on the kind of hyper local piece um, of the closed loop. This is a graphic that is also on our website for use. But first we're gonna do a few polls just to see who is participating today. So Brenda's gonna bring that up for us. So are you a community composter? a food scrap collection service, you can select all that apply, local government, state or federal government, or other. And once we get a good number of you responding, we will share those results. All right. Let's see, a lot of community composters. Hopefully many of you are members of the coalition um, and a decent number of food scrap collection services, government, and some other. Cool. Our next poll is, where are you at in your scaling up journey or your relationship with scaling up? So Brenda is gonna be running that. So this one's just a single choice. You can't select all. Which best describes you? Are you currently scaling up your community composting program? Interested in starting to? Or are you interested in how to support community composters who would like to scale up their operations or other? And once we get a good number of people responding, we'll share those results. All right, about a third are currently scaling up, many interested and a lot of supporters are here. So that is great. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, the reason why we did this is because 
it's true that a lot of community composters are in the process of scaling up um, the quantity that they're handling, but also that that is one of the number one challenges that community composters are facing. We saw that in our census results, our 2022 census that we did, um, both in terms of the business side and in site operations. So uh, that's the reason for today. But before we get started, uh, just a few housekeeping notes. If you have questions, we're gonna get to them after the presentations. Mostly you can put those in the little Q&A box um, and they will actually be, I believe we're setting it up so that everyone can see the questions that you're asking and then upvote the ones that you would like to also um, see answered. And then this time we also have live captions and translation as an option. So try that out. And there will be a feedback survey at the end of this webinar where you can let us know how that worked out for you because it's something new. And now, um, JD, if you wanna start bringing up your slides as I introduce you. So JD Hill is founder and co-owner of Recycled City in Phoenix Valley, Arizona, which since starting in 2013, has grown to handle over six tons of material a day. And our city uses that finished compost to build farmland, growing fresh produce for the local food economy. So hand it over to you, JD. All right, great. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, looks great. All right, so thank you. My name is JD. I am in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, I grew up in Minnesota, uh, went to ASU, and I've been living in Phoenix for the last 20 years. Um, and after I graduated from ASU in 2010, I really wanted to be a farmer. Um, I got a finance major from the W.P. Carey School of Business, and it was 2008-9. Um, my counselor told me, I had to take 18 more credits to get a sustainability degree. And ASU started the first school of sustainability that year. Um, so I got a degree in sustainability and that's really where I found my passion. And I really wanted to be a farmer after I graduated college. And I saw, you know, food waste and loss is a major problem for a lot of different reasons. You know, not just greenhouse gases, but it really affects everything. Um, and I moved home to Minnesota after I graduated college. That's where I grew up. And uh, I was trying to get a job, you know, as like a business analyst, financial analyst, and, and that didn't work out for me. And I was sitting at home watching uh, my favorite TV channel, CNBC. And they had something about uh, childhood obesity. And I was like, man, this is just terrible. You know, I really want to start um, making an impact. So this is a picture of me in 2011 at a community garden I started in my hometown. Um, you know, I was just a college kid unemployed sitting at home. And I went to my school board and my city council and we found this land and it's still going today. Um, you know, we really were thoughtful in how we set it up, the monitoring and, and enforcement. And this is kind of where I really started getting going. Um, but I wasn't, you know, making any money and I had a bunch of student debt. Um, so I moved back to Phoenix where I was a golf caddy. Uh, I was a golf caddy for all throughout college at a private golf club and I made some money doing that. So I was like, I'm gonna go back and do that. And then in 2012, I learned about the five gallon bucket business. Um, I had heard about Compost Cab and uh, Compost Now, and I was like, that that's how I'm going to sell vegetables. You know, anybody who is willing to, you know, do the right thing with their food waste, selling them the produce from the farm where their food waste goes, I go, that's, that has to be easy. I'm going to do it. So I just started going for it. Um here in Phoenix in 2013, I started. And from day one, I had that idea of, I was gonna sell you the produce from the farm where your food waste goes. And this was my like dream from day one. 
it's a sprinter van and it's it's uh modified where it has a refrigeration unit on it and a cargo space for the buckets so i said you know from day one i was like i'm gonna be distributing the food it's gonna cost me nothing um you know one truck one driver one insurance policy you know two revenue streams and i was really juiced up about this idea in 2013 but i i didn't have anything um so this is kind of how i started my my buddy he bought a property for almost nothing in a very bad part of downtown phoenix and he said yeah you can you know start your gardens here so this is me bokashi composting um i'm digging the trenches and i was fermenting the food waste and then burying it and uh doing that because that's that's what I had um and this is me in the backyard of that place you know making compost and uh, on the right um this is kind of how I started scaling up my business um this is the Tempe farmers market in uh, 2014 I went to Goodwill I found a old ironing board and the cloth and some letters and stuff and those are buckets, you know, I was finding be behind the, sh like the deli shops and stuff. They have the, they have the really crappy lids on them and people complained about those lids, but I just started signing people up and getting it going. And, uh, there's a picture of my first truck. You know, I just kind of strap a blue barrel back there. I'd show up at your house. I'd dump the bucket into the barrel. I'd wash the bucket out right there. I had a little, uh, bike thing in a in a neighborhood and uh a woman who was running that tempe farmer's market she was like man you're you need some help and she hooked me up with this uh, community farm in the lower right and uh, they had a tractor it's 2015 you know i'm making compost and giving the community farm all the compost that i'm making and this is me getting started at the community farm you know i'm there in the back I'm collecting all this. I started doing commercial at this point. And, you know, I I had a pitchfork in my hand back there and I'm going for it. Um, and at that point I was like, oh crap, you know, I need some help. I'm working 24, 48 hours in a row. So I called my buddy Stan. Stan's on the right here in the Minnesota hat. Him and I grew up across the street from each other. We've known each other since fourth grade. And I said, hey, I'll give you my bedroom that I'm renting, I'll go sleep on the couch, I'll pay you 300 bucks a week, you know, give you some of the company, you know, come on, let's go. And uh, he said yes, and he came down in 2015, the end of 15. And uh, in the lower right, you know, that's the same picture as the slide before this. So we're doing it, you know, we're making compost. We got like a little homeschool group here and uh, in 2016, end of it, we started leasing our own two and a half acres because I'm, you know, my dream is like, I want to grow the food. I need space. Um, so we started leasing two and a half acres, I found. And then we bought our first van. This is our first van in 2017. And our first employee, Jesus. Jesus is still an employee today. Um, this is about when the bank finally said, yeah, we'll give you an auto loan. Um, cause you know, I didn't have any income or, or credit and the student loans and stuff. And Stan and I, we, we really got the business going. We started hiring people. Um, you know, we're doing the farming, we're hiring great people, paying people, you know, 20, $25 an hour now as employees. Um, we got over 20 employees now. And all the residential compost that we collect, uh, we compost it ourselves on our farm. We spread it in the field and then we grow crops and we sell those crops in a farm box that we now have the Sprinter vans. And we're doing it all now, um, you know, 11 years later. Uh, it took till 2020 to buy the first Sprinter van with the modification. So in 2020 is really when we started scaling up that. And we've been focused on the EPA and what they're telling us. And I love the new, the new one a lot more. Um, this is our service area. So from day one, 
I was going for it. Um, I actually was doing buckets outside this service area. I've had to bring it in. Um, this is over 1200 square miles. The average household's paying us 20 bucks. I got 3,500 households actively doing it. This is our model. You know, we collect it, we compost it, we use it, we grow the food, we do deliver it back with your bucket. And anybody can do the food without being a compost customer. So you can still get the vegetables, even though you're not a compost customer. And you can just do the compost and not have to do the vegetables. Um, this is our monthly revenue from day one. So, you know, I'm working, it's working. Um, here in Phoenix, we don't have a lot of benefits economically. It, trash is super inexpensive. Um, cities are not incentivized economically to do stuff like this. But we think we can wor really work with cities. Um, we we can say I'm saving them money right now by take because most of the municipalities here in Phoenix actually pick up the trash and recycling. It's not private, so it's more municipal run here. So I'm saving the city's money by signing up their residents right now. I'm saving them hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in aggregate. And, you know, as my uh, program scales or programs like mine scale here in Phoenix, uh, we can make a huge economic savings for cities. We can divert a ton of food waste and we can create a resilient food system. Um, this model really addresses a lot of food system problems. So uh, one of the big problems is accessibility to food. Here in Phoenix, you know, half of the residents live in one. Um, and our model brings local farm produce, our produce, and we buy from other actual local farms. And we can deliver it right to the door. You know, the, our service area encompasses all neighborhoods. So it's available to everybody and we're really getting the price down on the vegetables. So we're really competitive with the natural grocers. Um, we can help with the farmland loss because this model, you know, I'm closing, finally, I'm closing on our own farm. Uh, it's a small farm. It's all we could get financing for, but a, at least it's something and we're growing. Um, and farm consolidation is a major problem. And my model, what it's turned into is all the revenue from the food waste we collect and the revenue people pay us to do that, we're able to pay all the overhead costs of a typical small farm. So we pay for the land, the water, the tractors, the diesel fuel, the extra chicken pellet. We give the farmer all the compost. We pay for the seed. All the overhead costs of a typical small farm, our city pays for. And then I contract with a farmer and he has his own LLC. I've been working with him for three years. He has no costs. I buy 100% of what they grow. And I have a revenue share agreement with that farmer. And they hire and pay their farmers what they what they want to. And it's a higher rate than other farms are paying. So, you know, he's getting very good, good employees. Um, and we say this is de-risking. Uh, local agriculture. This is de-risking urban farming. It's taking all the risk out and and because we're covering it with the reoccurring revenue of the food waste pickup, which is really steady and reliable. So we can do this and really bring land and all this stuff available to anybody. It's a huge equity thing. Um, and farm profitability, my, my farm, my farmer, has no cost. His only cost is labor. He's never going to go belly up on anything, any debt. Um, and, you know, it's, it's working, you know, they're making, he's making money. Um, and it's all because of this distribution model off the back of the food waste pickup. And we help a lot with these municipal things like food action plans, climate action plans. So we try to, you know, communicate that, hey, we, we can help out with these things. And I like to go into like the Seattle program. And I, I uh, appreciate the geography of Seattle and the really, uh, the political will, um, the strength of that in Seattle. 
Um, but I argue that these types of programs, these traditional municipal programs are more expensive. They mandate households into a program they don't voluntarily participate in. And that creates new problems that needs to be addressed by new policies and regulations. So here in Phoenix, everybody has a 96 gallon cart and recycling. In Seattle, that's 128 bucks a month. And uh, you just do some, sim some simple math with household income and how much these waste programs cost. If every resident in the city of Phoenix paid us 10 bucks a month for food waste pickup, you know, Phoenix residents would still be paying a lot less of their percentage of income on waste. So there's huge opportunity there. And we don't have to do things with political will like Seattle and the state of Washington has, has had to do to make their programs viable. And these programs have a lot of problems with contaminations and other issues, and they don't build any resiliency in the food system. I say they're completely disconnected from the food system. You know, the, the compost is really not something farmers want to use. It's not something farmers can really afford, et cetera. It's, it's, you can market about it, but in reality, I don't think they're that connected. Um, so, you know, you got your traditional municipal compost model. I, you know, would argue it lacks flexibility. It doesn't address household behavior, contaminations issue, doesn't build resilience in the food system. Where in our city, and now we've made this partnership with Mill, we can save money, we can increase household participation. We there is no contamination in the five gallon bucket. And uh it creates high paying local farming jobs, driving jobs, etc., that are really meaningful and people stick with them for a long time. Um, so I like to talk about, you know, like we're getting to this fork in the road. There's all these initiatives out there. Food's coming from 1,200 miles away. You know, we need everybody wants to build resiliency in the local food system. It can make a huge impact on the sustainable development goals. But you got these groups like farmers in Europe that are saying, hey, you know, we don't like this. Um, so, you know, what are we going to do? Well, I'd like to say, you know, this model of integrating the decentralized community circular model and the food is really a solution that can everybody can find something in. All sides can find something in this. Um, so I'd just like to say thank you and uh, look forward to answering any questions. Thanks, JD, for taking us on that journey. Um, it was very cool to see how community composting, one of the benefits, could be pushing back against farm consolidation. That's definitely up ILSR's alley. We do a lot of anti-monopoly work. Um, we do have some questions for you. Let's see. Um, one person asked, the next USCC conference is going to be in Phoenix. They were curious if you were going to be doing any kind of coordination with that, offering site visits, training, or presentations. Are you participating in any USCC events? I might be. I'm unsure right now. Okay, well, stay tuned. Um, could you say a little bit more about the mill partnership? That's been something that was kind of an emerging kind of issue interest with community composters has a lot of benefits some people aren't really clear on how it works so if you could say a little bit more about that i think folks would be interested yeah so you know i've been at this for 11 years with the five gallon bucket and we do commercial with the 64 gallon roll cart and the 60 gallon uh, drum um and it's hard to sign people up for the bucket. It really is. Um, it's not easy. Um, and two years ago, 
uh, right about when the whole inflation thing started, oil went up. Um, our ability to sign people up at the farmer's market disappeared. Like it was obvious. I was at six, seven farmer's markets. I was signing people up every week. And then all of a sudden, you know, nobody's signing up. Um, and that's been going on for two years. <clears throat> um, there's no economic incentives here. You don't, you're just spending more money when you sign up with me. Um, so it's been really hard to sign people up for residential. And one of the biggest reasons after finances is people in my household don't like this. I'm the only one that does this. Um, and people quit and they're like, hey, we'll try it again later if I can get my family to do it. Um, and that's mainly related to the, the ick factors of smell and handling the material. It's really not something more than one out of 10 at max of households really want to deal with. Um, you know, my service is available to 1.5 million households. I have 3,500 and I've, and this is cheap. Like my, my, my service is 10 to 30 bucks a month. Like I have one of the least expensive service plans out there across the country and it's a clean bucket. We're not dropping, we're not just dumping the bucket. So we're switching it out with a clean bucket and we always go back and exchange your bucket. Our customer service is phenomenal. Um, And so when the mill people reached out to me. Um, I got really excited about it because I said to my, I saw some things like, all right, this is going to help bring on a lot more households, you know, to my program. Um, and it's going to get municipalities a lot more interested in my, in my business. Um, you know, I, I've, I've been asking, the 12 or more municipalities I'm in to do co-promotion, to tell their residents I'm available, you know, and it's, it's been really hard. So, you know, I see a lot of promise and then the, the people at mill um, are great. So, you know, they're not talking like this stuff is compost. Um, you know, it's not compost. Um, so they're being really clear about that. Um, so, so, you know, I have, I have nothing uh, but good to say so far. Great. Thanks for, yeah, telling us a little bit more about that. I'm sure we'll get a few more questions for you, but we're gonna get to those at the end of the presentations and move on to Michael, if you want to start sharing your slides while I introduce you. Um, Michael is executive director of LA Compost, which has grown from a group of volunteers on bikes to a major network of composting hubs across LA County. And I also have to mention that Michael just earlier this year was honored with Isla Sars Composting for Community Groundbreaker Award for his leadership in our corner of the composting field. So shout out to that. Um, Michael, take it away. Thanks, Clarissa, and thanks everyone for joining us uh, virtually. Uh, it's an honor to share this space with the other panelists and also just a joy to be a part of this collective network across the country that is growing each week and really exciting to just um, both be in it and witness it from the sideline. Uh, my brief talk and conversation today is centered uh, similar to JD on our growth over the past 10, 11 years and how we've really scaled into key intentional strategic collaborative relationships with city, county, and state entities and municipalities to ensure that the work that we are doing um, that has a human-centered focus um, can continue despite new policies, Senate bills, and um, citywide organics collection motion. So um, LA Compost, like all of our work, was an idea uh, stemmed from my time teaching um, in the fifth grade classroom. Uh, my students did not know where food came from, let alone where it went. And it was an opportunity for me to uh, allow for folks to construct their own knowledge and hold space for 
knowledge sharing to occur. So by no means was this a farm. It was like a $500 restaurant grant I got to build some raised beds and allow for kids to know where food came from and where it went and how it could return to the soil. And our mission, vision, and values early on, which was just like from waste to food, how do we show this closed loop system like we all are trying to do across the country in a way in which it is decentralized, it is close to home, and people can see it in their communities. Like many community composters across the country, we started on bike over a decade ago, um, from small trailers to our own built trailers to counter carts that many of us have seen out in Florida many years ago. Um, similar to JD, um, in and out here in Los Angeles, there was the white pickle buckets. We dumpster uh, dived all those buckets and that was just our first fleet of collection. Um, and it was just me. It was just me and a volunteer here or there just collecting food scraps, building compost bins in friends and family's backyards. The compost we created, we gave away at farmer's markets. Any donations we received, we built school gardens. So it was a cute idea and it was a thoughtful idea, but not one that was sustainable by any means in a uh, complex geographical city like Los Angeles. We were getting phone calls from all parts of the city, from the west side, San Fernando Valley, South Central, but where we were located by no means were we going to be able to scale based on this uh, approach that we were taking. So it was a moment of pause. It was an opportunity for us to reflect on our operations um, and really recognize that we are operating in the most populated county in the country. There's over 10 million people that call LA County home. And how do we mimic um, just strong networks? And it's unfortunate that this image is redlined by freeways, but if you step back and squint your eyes, you could pretend it's roots or mycorrhizal fungi or, or some type of connector of communities. And for us, that's kind of the model that we started to pivot in 2014. This map's a few years old, but we started to establish a decentralized network of community composting hubs and drop-off locations. This specific map shows like our parks and farmers markets, but in 2014, we just started in schools and churches, museums, community gardens, parks, um, and housing projects, libraries, anywhere where there's food, people, and the ability to tell the full story of food. We started to um, get small grants to then hire individuals from the community to be the quote unquote compost managers. And these individuals were just incredible stewards that were able to facilitate this work in their specific communities. And it was such an, an amazing opportunity for, for folks to connect with the soil, for them to connect with the composting process. And for LA Compost to kind of transcend the backyard shadow activity that composting usually exists in, into more front and center locations. And really saying that anywhere where there's food, people and the ability to tell that full story of food, we can kind of come alongside and build both the physical and social infrastructure for this to, to be done well. The heart of our work is rooted in our community partnerships and our nonprofit and small business partnerships all throughout LA County. We do a lot of work with local workforce youth development groups, such as different conservation and state chapters centered around youth workforce development. There was a lot of old bins all throughout the city that we started to work with Conservation Corps, um, training carpentry skills and how to rehab a lot of these bins for the many community gardens that exist throughout LA. And this community hub drop-off model is nothing new or unique or amazing or innovative by any means. It's very much feeding into the convenient habit of dropping off mail, library book, or clothes at a dry cleaner. And we really uh, found out early on that all we were doing was creating the convenience for someone to drop off, but we're lacking that connection. So rather than it just being like drop off hours for here, we really wanted to transition it to more of a cooperative model. One that included the people who were part of this um, program, one that allowed their neighbors to get to know one another, one that connected them to the full story of food and not just a, a nice redwood bin that was aesthetically clean. And we saw a huge change when we started to allow for more of a cooperative involvement uh, from the general public to participate, to receive the compost, to receive some produce, and just be connected to a green space in a city that is very much lacking it. Um, in 2017, it's when it started to go from idea and um, thought into legitimate uh, consideration by the city. There was a food waste task force that launched in 2017 that I was able to be a part of. And we worked with the city's GIS team to map out the potential for community composting growth across the city of Los Angeles. This is just city of LA, not county of LA, which we operate, but they basically mapped out every nursery, community garden, pocket park, library, 
church with X amount of square footage available. And it really showcased a nice um, dispersed sprinkling of dots showcasing the potential for community composting in the city of LA. And it really gave us the motivation to continue this idea and know that we weren't the gatekeepers of this idea, but could freely pass along our model. How do we allow for the mistakes that we've um, had and made? How do we expedite someone else's journey via technical assistance, compost coaching, bin build plans, et cetera? In 2019, the year before the pandemic, the city of LA came out with their city Green New Deal sustainability plan. In that plan, we were listed as a key partner and many of their initiatives centered around waste and recovery were verbatim of our program offerings. Uh, there is a desire to develop a master plan to expand community and regional compost infrastructure based on the map that we helped work on. There was a desire to establish food scrap drop-off locations at every city farmer's market based on our pilot program, very much modeled after New York and other cities across the country. And this document was a nice win for us to just have our work on paper and to have the city of Los Angeles say they were behind it, but that's kind of all it was at that time. But one of the things that we were able to do to take it from just a piece of paper and have it have a little bit more teeth behind it was to introduce a motion with some local city council members. This kind of was around the time when that Kiss the Ground film came, came out. Um, now there's that common ground one. So we were like using the momentum of just um, regenerative farming, carbon sequestration, the lingo that was being used in the day. And we were able to pass a motion that really allowed for different municipal agencies, such as the sanitation department and parks department to really focus on healthy soil and circular economies, keeping resources local and explicitly name the nonprofits and small groups they were to work with. So Regenerate LA passed. It allowed for a clear expansion of farmer's market food scrap collection, a clear expansion of uh, park processing in city, city parks. And at that same time, um, the Climate Emergency Mobilization Office launched here in Los Angeles, to which they asked LA Compost to be a commissioner on that, which would guide climate policy in our city and guide um, council and mayor's policy plans moving forward, which we're now moving from a bike and from co-ops to now being part of the policies that are going to kind of shape the narrative for the next decade. The farmer's market was a great opportunity for us to really showcase that snapshot full story of food from dropping off the food scraps, shopping for your week's produce, and also receiving some of that finished compost from us. We're currently at 15 markets uh, with the goal of being at 20 uh, by the end of this year, and which will increase to 25 next year, uh, getting us to nearly half of all markets in the city of Los Angeles. Similar to our, our co-op model, we don't need to be at every market, physically LA Compost. We can support other partner groups to do so as well. And we're starting to explore what that looks like. But this model is nothing new. Many of you on the call have done this um, and have been doing this um, for quite some time. What's great is just the critical mass of foot traffic and the human interactions that occur and the consistency that occurs um, in, in this process. I think um, the co-ops are phenomenal, but sometimes you don't see an individual, but the farmer's market's been a really wonderful opportunity for us to grow into the human engagement and ability to coexist well over the past few years. Another nice scaled milestone was when the city actually recognized this activity and is actually putting our work on their website as some of the solutions for organics recycling and uh, food waste diversion. In the city of LA, in the state of California, we have Senate Bill SB 1383, which has a mandate to divert food scraps from landfill and is requiring the entire state of California to do that. So there's different timelines as in regards to how each city is carrying out that mandate. And that's impacting uh, many composters along the way. So when um, individuals were now able to put their food scraps in a green bin. We did see a drop off in participation at some of our farmers markets. But the thing about Los Angeles is that it's so vast and geographically spread out. You're talking 10 million people. This um, offering Organics LA that the city was offering is only servicing roughly 750,000. So we're not talking about any multifamily, any small business. There's a, still a huge gap in need for this. So it's been a little bit of an up and down over the past few years, but we've seen a, we've seen a steady increase of drop-off participants at our farmer's markets over the past few months, and also a ton of new cities requesting this um, offering in their location as well. I will say we are a nonprofit. Um, we function as a nonprofit. Majority of our funds come from private and public foundations, contracts, joint federal funding. 
Um, the USDA grant that many of us are aware of, we are uh, we have received it twice. We are in the second round of it at this point. And we are working with the city of Los Angeles to allow for community composting infrastructure across all council districts in our city. That includes co-ops, that includes farmers markets, and that includes uh, park models, which we'll be talking about shortly. But I would highly encourage all of you to start to engage with your city's um, municipal departments as it relates to rec and parks, sanitation, public works, wherever it may be, um, to allow for them to see you as a collaborator in this work, not selling out by any means, but really showcasing the individual genius and magic that you bring to this work, which is very community focused and human centered. Um, additionally, we've been working with Cal Recycle for roughly four years, the state recycling agency here in California. There has been a community composting for green space grant program that we've been part of for both cycles now. The second cycle, LA Compost, is in charge of facilitating and managing uh, over a million dollars for the region, which we've been supporting over 80 locations that transcend and exceed, obviously, LA Compost's own reach. And it's just been great to be uh, viewed as a leader in this movement, at least here in the state and the city, and also entrusted with the resources to be able to support someone along the way. Not only are we providing financial resources and kind of being a conduit of those resources from state to new community composters, we're, we're, we're able to share a decade worth of lived experience with them to expedite their journey as well and see them grow and, and thrive. Um, one of the biggest things that I've been focusing on is our park models. There's roughly 80,000 acres of parkland in the city and county of Los Angeles and square footage is expensive and comes at a premium here in Southern California. So how do we start to reimagine where we can compost close to home? Uh, it's been incredible just to see recreation depart, uh, recreation and parks department, both at the city and county level respond uh, so positively to this. Um, this is a snapshot of uh, a hub at Griffith Park, a 4,400 acre park where we've processed a little over 2 million pounds of material at this location, um, which is coming from the farmer's market, small businesses, food recovery agencies. We've been able to uh, secure joint collaborative funding uh, with the city to launch five parks by the end of this year as well as two county parks to bring us to a total of seven. Um, oftentimes when I give these talks, I, I share a story of how I grew up next to one of the largest landfills in the country, and that is still true. But what is uh, really exciting is that landfill is in the process of turning into a regional park, which we are now included in conversation to have composting occur on top of that once landfill, which kind of is the ultimate full, full circle story um, as it relates to landfill park and now building soil again. Um, in addition to working with parks, we've done a lot of healthy soils projects um, under Regenerate LA and the Green New Deal to look at organic matter increase, water saturation, um, and other uh, variables as it relates to mulching and composting certain areas of the park. And it's just been a joy to have a larger space to actually work with the general community across Los Angeles, turning a pile sifting it together, and then all the compost that we generate at the park, we give back to the park department to use, as well as have we have monthly um, free compost distribution days for all Angelinos to come and take what they need for their own gardening needs. The, huge, the One of the biggest growth um, growing areas that we've experienced is our educational offerings. I, I would say it's the glue that connects all our programs together. And we very much invest in that first community word as we do that second compost word. And our education really varies from microscopy soil sessions and community soil labs that we have um, in the public throughout Los Angeles. We are teaching workshops or passive education everywhere we are, whether it's at a market, at a tabling event, at a designated uh, Spanish workshop where we teach um, English Spanish uh, instruction um, to one of our newest programs that we're really excited and has been an idea for um, in my head for quite some time, which is a traveling mobile field trip called the Magic Soil Bus, uh, very much a play on the nostalgia of the Magic School Bus, but very much a zero emissions bus that's going to be going to various uh, K-12 to LAUSD schools across the, the city, instructing them on the benefits of composting, the joys of uh, growing food in your community and how they can make an impact on their own campus and their own home. I am a father of two, um, Ezra and Diego, and the best form of marketing and um, and changing habits is for a kid to tell you to, to do something a little different or something they learned at school. I grew up in LA 
and I had the earthquake bus come to my campus and it created a uh, traumatizing core memory in my head as far as a bus shaking and telling me how to strap a cup in my counter correctly. So the goal of this magic soil bus is to create positive core memories for youth to understand compost, to understand soil, and to understand the many benefits that it provides. Uh, shameless prog, I also wrote a kid's book called Composting for Community. And one of the things that I often like to just say is the work that we are collectively doing is um, embodying the work that's happening below the ground. The soil network that allows for life to communicate, resources and water to be shared is what we are doing above the ground via our human network. So it's a joy to do this in LA, but it's also a joy to step back and reflect on how we are a part of this national human network of um, community composters who are inoculating goodness in our zip code. So the core of what we do is community engagement, cultivating community members to inoculate goodness wherever they go. Um, we oftentimes say that the beauty of a compost pile comes from the collective imperfections and diversity of ingredients. The beauty of our city, Los Angeles, comes really from all the people who call it home. Uh, we're approaching nearly 30 staff who are not all pictured here, all representing a different part of LA, all coming with various backgrounds and lived experiences. And um, it's just a joy to be able to hold space and actually grow this work for the next decade of composters that come come alongside us as well. So. Um, thank you for your time. My email is there. Um, it's it's great to be here and also just follow the footsteps of champions such as Charlie and Marissa, who we're going to hear from next. So thanks. All. Thanks, Michael. As coalition coordinator, I'm definitely taking notes on all of your nature metaphors for connection, microbial networks, all that. Um, and after JD made the case for community composting being an asset for government, it's really nice to see LA recognizing that and helping a community composting network thrive there. And also how community education engagement is another way to address that potential ick factor of composting, neutralize that. Um, let's see, maybe we can get to one quick question before we move on. Um, back to the kind of community engagement piece of it, folks are curious about how you motivate people to sign up for your services at farmers markets. Is there a certain way that you do that? Yeah, I think it's just the consistency of us being there. I mean, we do obviously the outreach and canvassing and flyers. Um, I think there's oftentimes little critical mass moments where there's like a line for our booth for folks to like use our app to snapshot how much they're they're dropping off and so on but um we are very much engaging with all the vendors we do um canvassing around um the blocks that surround that farmers market specifically for like high density housing and small businesses um, but it's usually around a three to six month time between like us being there where we actually start to see a spike in participation and it's a completely free service and it's not necessarily they have to sign up you just show up and participate um, and there's kind of no um, significant entry roadblock for folks to just participate. Well, that definitely helps. Accessibility is key. Thanks, Michael. Mm -hmm. All right, mm -hmm. moving on to Marissa and Charlie. I think Brenda's bringing up those slides now. Uh, Marissa and Charlie are with Earth Matter in New York City's Governor's Island, to be exact, where they have been promoting resource recovery and healthy soils since 2009. Their Zero Waste Island Initiative is a model of closed loop materials management, and they also have another perspective on how public-private partnerships interact with scaling up, so we might hear a bit about that. Um, and now over to you both. Thank you, and thanks to ISLR for hosting this discussion. We're honored to be listening and learning from the other inspirational panelists, and we are really really grateful to be members of this national community composting movement. I'm Marissa D. Dominicus. I'm an, the ED and co-founder of Earth Matter. And I'm Charlie Byer, the co-founder and composting operations manager of Earth Matter. Uh, it is great to be in this company. JD, nice to meet you. Michael, nice to be with you again. Next. So, I want to step back a little prior to Earth Matter. Our genesis actually was similar to Michael in New York City, recognizing that there were two issues that needed addressing, both the 
health and productivity, the nutrient content of urban garden soils, and waste reduction as a priority for everyone. And thinking that we could address them both by uh, capturing that food scrap that was being misdirected into the garbage stream and turning it into an amendment that could be returned to gardens. So we started that uh, with a single drop-off location at a farmer's market and a, a hub and spoke system of four community gardens that accepted the material. Uh, that grew and grew and grew to a point where uh, we needed a little bit of money to begin trucking the material a little further away. Um, we asked our participants that same question, Michael, about whether they would be willing to participate. And in the end, they were more willing to give us a dollar each time they dropped off. And it actually became a very easy measure of participation, just counting the dollars at the end of the day. Uh, we understood how much uh, participation we had and, and almost to the pound how much we were collecting. Uh, but that uh, gave us the funds we needed to actually incorporate and become Earth Matter in 2009. And at the same time, hand off the farmer's market collection to a uh, green market uh, program of Grow NYC here in the city that operates many of the farmer's markets. And they saw it as a resource uh, for growing market participation, particularly in the wintertime when markets were smaller. Um, and it took a couple of years for them to put that program together. And this was now 2011, 2012. At the same time, the Department of Sanitation, who had been running the New York City Compost Project for nine years as a outreach and education program, teaching people, homeowners, community gardeners, how to make compost on their own, recognized that, well, there were a few of us who were making it on scale of some sort, and maybe they should support that as well. So in 2012, uh, that program expanded to include uh, three additional sites that were like ours, taking in food scrap from farmer's markets. And by the spring of 2012, we began to receive funding, Earth Matter New York did, from the New York City Department of Sanitation and the New York City Compost Project. Um, we had already relocated here to Governor's Island and established a small site to begin taking that material. I think at that point we took it on a monthly basis and it was somewhere around five or 6,000 pounds uh, from seven markets. And uh, the Department of Sanitation felt they could expand on that, that they should expand on that and began to fund uh, Grow NYC to do that. And through the years, uh, up until uh, just recently, that program had grown to uh, 200 or more uh, drop-off locations, about 60 or 70 of those at farmer's markets and the rest at other locations like libraries, like subway stops, uh, some of them composting there on site, some of them supported by uh, other organizations like ours here in the city. Um, so here on the island, uh, yes, we advocate a very tightly closed loop. We would like to think that we capture all of the organic material generated on the island, we compost it here, and that compost gets used here. Uh, and our illustration here on the right is of that uh, table to farm uh, cycle where food vendors here on the island uh, are selling food People are eating what they don't eat. We feed to our chickens, we compost the rest. We grow food here on the island. Some of that goes back into the vendor loop. Um, the island itself is uh, just off the tip of Manhattan in the middle of New York Harbor, 172 acres. Uh, the island by its nature has a very uh, clear border. So it's easy to monitor what goes in and what goes out. So the idea of getting to zero waste uh, has, has a, uh, a few things built into it. The island is uh, owned by the city, former military installation, but now owned by the city and managed by the Trust for Governor's Island uh, for its operations, its maintenance, and its development as an economic resource for the island. 
pick it up. Sure, I'll pick it up for the next slide. And the island very much supports zero waste. In 2017, they um, worked a lot more um, with us as far as creating the book of uh, mandates for the people that are on the island. Um, here we have a slide that shows how we kind of class the four programs that we have. They're all interactive, they're all interwined and they're all overlapping. Um, but our Compost Learning Center is really our landing base for exploration. We have individuals and groups come to get on uh, hands-on experiential learning. And we do everything from composting to zero waste event management to animal care, all the different ways that demonstrate we're part of the life cycle and that waste of one is food for another. And the zero waste aspect of it that is most public facing is the compostable serviceware that all the vendors and, and event producers are mandated to use if they're using single use serviceware. There are about eight uh, semi-permanent vendors on the island working out of converted sea containers, sort of like food trucks without wheels, and uh, another four semi-permanent restaurants, only one of which is set up to be using reusable washable serviceware. So to date. To date, yes, to date. More on that later, but um, you can see that uh, now on a busy weekend day, when there are 10 to 15,000 visitors to the island and perhaps an event, the diversion of all of that serviceware really is a, a major waste reduction from the recycling and, and uh, garbage streams. Uh, we are a uh, both a yard waste and a food waste facility. Uh, we're taking all of the uh, landscape debris from the island and all of the all of the leaves from the island as well into our compost recipe. And just for scale, there's been over 1 million visitors to the island this past year. And uh, we're definitely gonna set a new record this year. I don't think we mentioned that we've been here for 15 years. Um, and uh, we have this third program, the Lavender Field, which is um, a demonstration of how we would like everybody who's doing composting, everyone who's visiting the island, everyone who's interested in sustainability could feel that they could benefit from the environment if we're nurturing our land and the land can give back to us. Our Soil Start Farm um, is a demonstration of growing everything above the soil that exists on GI. Um, it's only a small parcel of land, an eighth of an acre, um, but it has a terrific network of mugwort rhizomes underneath as does a lot of the areas of Governor's Island. And so it's a way for us to demonstrate that our urban soils often are places that we recommend that you don't necessarily want to use directly, either because in an urban setting, there's heavy metals, um, invasives, a, a number of reasons. But we do have on our farm um, like a barrier. So that everything on top is primarily compost. And we're also experimenting with what grows well in a primary compost area since that's what we have a lot of. Um, we do grow a native and pollinator area and we have a heritage bed project that grew organically based on all the people in New York, the diversity of cultures that have food um, as a really important part of what um, is uh, resonates for them. And so we have um, about 13 different farmers from different cultures that help demonstrate uh, what is important to them culturally and there's a lot of conversations that get started um, with that when people, visitors come by um, and, and we share each other, both uh, food that we grow there and just experiences that we have culturally. Uh, most of the annual vegetables and flowers that we grow uh, are given to a soup kitchen. And there's a small percentage at this point that um, we're giving to island vendors or selling to them. And that's part of when we say we're scaling up we currently um, feel that there's a great opportunity for us to uh, be able to do more in that sector of showing the close loop of selling more food to the vendors as we increase our, our production with food. So over the 10 years that we've been on this particular site on the island, we've kind of grown in our capacity in a very organic way. Uh, pushing out the boundaries and, and accessing new bits of space as we needed them. 
we're working entirely in existing found spaces. Uh, essentially, in this picture, it's the parking lot that was there to serve those two buildings in the background. And there are several others just like it. They're all exactly the same. They make great composting pads. Um, but uh, in these, these stats here, the 750 tons of organics and the two, 260 yards of compost, that's, I think, from 2023. Uh, 2020 was kind of a big year for us in that uh, the portion of the island where we're located was rezoned for further development. And uh, that did two things. It, it uh, forced us to be locked into the footprint that we have. Um, it uh, also, as part of the rezoning, we were able to uh, get a clause to ensure our continued use of some space on the island if we were to lose this space. Um, and what was the third thing about that? I just want to say that that's, that footprint is 1.2 acres. So that's the cool. island is 172 acres. And of that, we occupy a little bit more than one acre. And so we are going to have to relocate. So that's really changing up what we're thinking of as far as as we move, we have this great opportunity to kind of rethink a few things. Um, I'm not sure what that third thing you were talking about, but I'll, I'll just keep going with, um, we do a lot of volunteer work days. Um, we have them scheduled. We had them before our funding got cut every Friday. We have them during our open hours. We do a lot of different youth and adult training programs. We have um, community gardeners that come on a regular basis, two different times a year for a series. We have adults coming on Saturdays throughout the season to learn not only about compost, but also about urban farming. Um, we have a group of seniors that come and we have just a straight up farm team that comes up on a regular basis. Um, and um, the visitors that are streaming through during our public open hours, um, part of what the island offers all groups um, as an exchange for rent is that you, you serve the public good. And so on Saturdays and Sundays from May until October, we open our doors and people come to see our chickens. They come, we're doing a goat naming contest right now. Um, and, and they can engage, they can drop in, do whatever it is we're doing, um, take home some compost. Most of the workshops that we host are free. They're um, mostly public facing and they really stem from anything from plant cyanotypes to a uh, compost as um, Michael's, we do uh, microscope work, we do soil testing work, we do we do a lot of different soup to nuts kinds of workshops. So uh, when we started this project on the island, bringing in material from off island, we always knew that sometime in the future, the city's curbside program would be ramping up and taking away our work. And we also understood that development on the island would begin to produce more and more organic material that we could compost. And that somehow these two things would, would cross and it would all be a nice transition. <laughs> um, well, it's happening uh, more abruptly and, and faster than we could have imagined. Um, we've begun taking in two years ago uh, far more commercially produced organic material here on the island than we had been, which has shifted the way some of our, our funding works because we can't be using public funds to, to process that material. Uh, and at the same time, the city's curbside program in this mayoral administration has gone full scale, uh, available now across Brooklyn and Queens soon to be available in the Bronx and Staten Island with Manhattan coming on board a little bit later. Um, and But at the same time, if you don't have your brown bin that the municipality is picking up, they have installed these smart bins where you have a code and you can just drop off your compost. That, that's the big belly orange, orange bin there on the corner. And so, you know, we do feel that we've been, we've done a lot of the work of raising awareness about the need for composting since we started. Um, we, as both as part of members of the New York City Community Composting um, uh, from the DSNY, 
and outside of that scope as our nonprofit, we've really been part of a huge collaborative effort with many partners that contributed to why and how New York City now has a municipal compost program that's been scaling up to serve all New Yorkers. However, we do not believe that the work is anywhere near done. Um, as you can see from the slide, the uh, picture on the right, um, the current capture rates are not as good as we'd like. Um, it's like under 4% in Queens from what the curbside program is collecting. Um, and this is our council member, uh, Abreu, who heads up the Council Sanitation and Solid Waste Committee at Earth Matter, speaking about how he supports and the city council members far and large support the continuation of community composting funding through municipal funds. But as you know, many of you, in December, the Department of Sanitation and the mayor um, cut the funding for the community composting partners who had contracts for work that had been supported since the 1990s. Um, but we have been working really quite hard in the last six months with the Save Our Compost Coalition, all of the city council members and others to advocate for the community composting to continue. Um, we believe that we're still very important uh, to New York City municipal composting. We demonstrate that composting locally um, is important because seeing is believing. And what we do is accessible, it's transparent illustration that neighbor food scraps are a valuable resource. Um, and we believe that we're really well equipped to help with the educational part of the municipal composting. So as much as the the uh, Department of Sanitation and the, and the city at large is saying that uh, perhaps we aren't so important, the, the Trust for Governors Island is saying, yes, you are our zero waste identity is something we value and we'd like to see you continue your work with handling at least the material that's generated here on the island, um, which I didn't get to say earlier, uh, our facility at, at 800 tons a year can take in far more than the island generates. And at the same time, at the other end, we produce far more material than in finished compost than the island can, can manage to make use of just given uh, staffing levels at this point with the BART team and the landscape crew. Uh, so a lot of that material leaves the island at this point, um, goes, out, goes out into the community garden network and, and directly to parks. I like to say that, yes, we are on valuable land now doing this work, but the work we're doing is increasing land values throughout the city, wherever our compost is being used. Um, so in scaling back to working with just what the island produces on a smaller footprint uh, of land available, uh, we've recognized a couple of technical points that we need to work on uh, to get more material through uh, faster on a, on a smaller piece of ground. and. A big piece of that, I think, is going to be uh, shredding, shredding of the landscape materials. Uh, there's a piece in our process uh, between like the fourth and the ninth month where it's it's a very slow uh, progression of decomposition, consumption of those higher cellulose materials. Um, but we like to maintain that kind of quality. And the way to do that, I think, is to give all those uh, microbes and all that fungi more surface area through that period of time. Um, we're, Two minutes heads up, just so you know. OK, um, we're, we're going to be retaining the use of uh, gore cover and moving from uh, a large windrow into aerated bays. And we're also hoping to be able to set up uh, the earth flow in vessel uh, 20 cubic yard system to get an idea of what that will do, um, particularly on a continuous flow basis. And uh, because we see it as perhaps a device that could be distributed 
uh, into much smaller, uh, very tight urban locations. Um, last year, the City Planning Commission recognized composting uh, as a as a legitimate use in a commercial zone. So, uh, one of the things the whole movement in the city is is going to be looking at soon, I think, is to identify uh, very small sites, uh, relatively speaking, that that uh, could be used as as compost sites. All right, quickly to wrap it up um, on our uh, revenue side. We're diversifying. Um, the red definitely is the program revenue, not only from the community composting, but from grants we have from our training program. The contributed revenue in the yellow are um, individuals as well as groups that come to um, help defray the costs of providing the program. And the earned revenue is the slice that continues to grow as the island grows. And so even though we're scaling back right now, there's more events this year on the island um, anticipated than there were uh, two years ago. So um, we do see the island as it develops as a way for us to continue to um, continue that closed loop on the island. And our last slide, oh, that was the other slide. Uh, it's okay. We had, um, we're, we are reach, I'm sorry, because this was the other slide. Um, whoop, that's good. No, we didn't, we didn't have to anyway, go ahead. We believe our reach will continue to grow and extend beyond Governor's Island in New York City because people are coming here from all ages um, and all scopes of all scopes for looking at a beacon of closed loop systems. We're exploring the reusables program um, to create a compostable service where we um, instead of wait, we're looking to do a reusables instead of the current compostable model. Um, and we're looking to show how people can build capacity um, outside of the island. One example is we're working with New York City Public Housing Authority. We help them create their own three bin system at a preschool and it's managed by an after school youth program adjacent to the preschool. And so as with everyone else that is presenter on this um, panel discussion, we're all involved in this community composting movement, and we know that our goal is shared with many of you to show concrete ways of what people can do and provide ongoing technical support and opportunities to help them achieve their goals. Thank you. Thank you both. You definitely have been a beacon, I know, to many in our network and appreciate you sharing your story. Um, we do have a question for, oh, really quickly, I'll just mention uh, ILSR put out an article on the New York City compost situation. If you'd like to learn more about that, maybe Brenda can put that in the chat. Um, but we have a question for you. Folks were curious about if you could say a little bit more about where you get your funding. And then also um, maybe if you have any tips for other people looking to fundraise scaling up, what would you suggest? Well, currently we are going to different city council members and Parks Green Thumb uh, can supports us for training the community gardeners that are doing community work in their gardens. So if you have a community center uh, or you want to do community composting, they send them to us. We're very fortunate to continue to expand that relationship for two different training programs. And our youth, we have, um, we have private support from places like Con Edison, um, and we have a lot of support from foundations. So our fundraising going to grants and foundation, while it, it's a lot of small little pieces, have been adding up. And um, we're fortunate in New York City, as you've seen some, from some of those slides, that we're right in the backdrop of the financial center. So we have a lot of corporations that want to do team building. We do anything from doing a lunch and learn virtually for places like Google to being able to host those groups that come onto the island that want to either celebrate their sustainability with their teams or look for ways that their members can take back to either their office or just to give them a way, because the island really is an oasis, a way away and for them to rejuvenate just even their relationships. And a, a lot of the, the green teams are tasked with understanding ways that they can continue to delve in more on ways that their companies can be greener. and. Um, so, you know, we always say, just bring your water bottle, bring your, your cap and 
and we do hands-on for them and more and more people want to come out. We have a lot of educational um, institutions, some private institutions that come back on a regular basis, and some of them come for a series. Those are just a few of the different ways that we raise money. And uh, the uh, fee for service um, with the lavender field, more and more people are um, interested, like a florist that want to sell it or they pick their own bouquet. And so, uh, believe it or not, even the lavender festival raised quite a significant amount um, to host um, every year. So, those are just a few of our streams. Yeah, it definitely seems like community composting in that it does so many things community engagement, it closes the loop, fresh produce, it's kind of naturally diverse revenue sources. So that's great. Um, JD, Michael, do either of you going to open up that question to you both? Do you have any tips for community composters that are scaling up and want sustainable funding sources? Michael, I'll pass it to you. Um, I haven't found that yet. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a fleeting answer for sure, but um, you unfortunately need to have money to try to raise more or get more because there's a certain level of trust and transactional nature from philanthropy to have to show what you've been able to manage in your books for X amount of years. But um, I think for us, it's just like so what Charlie and Marissa, like diversifying your funds is, is key because if one pulls the rug out from under you, you want to still have redundancy in the system to operate in some capacity. So for us, it very much was like 90% grants and foundations. And now we're trying to get more so contracts and corporations and individual givings and campaigns and employee matching. And um, I think the biggest sustainable funding is a variety um, pie chart of where your funding comes from. Um, contracts are key especially if you can get them for longer than five years or multi-year and we're trying to enter into those conversations. But um, yeah, I would say the closest thing to that is long-term contracts or diverse nature of your funding sources. Another question for, for you all is um, scaling up operations, JD mentioned, can be a little bit tough when it comes to contamination or just that's something that industrial centralized composting deals with a lot of but even community composting when you scale up um how do you deal with those increased levels of contamination what have you found is a successful strategy jd can i pass this one to you yeah uh, so residential, you know, we use the five gallon bucket and we dump the buckets out one at a time. So that's really easy, you know, to deal with contamination. And I know there's a lot of uh, community composters that do a great job at actually knowing what bucket was what customer, um, which I find a, a very neat <laughs> thing. I'm not doing that, but um, I could see how that would be useful and really helpful. Um, on the commercial side, so we do restaurants and hotels and office buildings and corporate cafeterias, and that's where we find all the contamination. Um, and we don't use a garbage truck. We use a box truck with a lift gate. You know, we get 28 roll carts in the box truck that are clean. And we show back up at the farm with 28 roll carts that are full of food waste. And we put one guy up on the top and one guy on the ground. And we dump those out one at a time. Um, and, you know, we pick through it. Um, and we don't need to spend, you know, millions of dollars on pieces of equipment um, to deal with the contamination. Uh, we work with the City of Phoenix compost facility uh, for most of our commercial waste, and we leave them an extremely clean stream of, of compostables. Um, I've heard these are the cleanest compostables I've ever seen. Um, so we're, we're, it's working out great. And we, if there is a problem, we take pictures, and those pictures are sent to the customer. And we, we don't do penalties. We just say, hey, look at these pictures. You know, this is what we think we need to do. And we always, we've never had a problem 
you know, working with the customer to solve it, to solve it. Yeah, that's great. It's definitely one of the lesser known benefits of community composting that it reduces contamination. Um, I'm curious if there are any other un kind of more unexpected benefits or impacts from keeping the composting process local and circular as you've scaled up that you've seen. Um, this is a question for everyone, maybe particularly when it comes to equity or environmental justice. And perhaps I'll pass to Michael first because I know that you tailor a little bit different sites to different communities. So that could be one way, but maybe something else comes to mind. Yeah, I mean, like historically, the waste industry is oftentimes burdened like poor, like hot communities um, almost all the time. And how it's zoned, how it's planned, um, we can dive into that for another time. But we very much want to see this as a resource reinvestment in communities versus bearing the weight and brunt of an issue. And we want to show that it can, of course, improve soil health, beautify green spaces, support with the tree canopy and create jobs. And I think for us, it's equity is ensuring that our sites and our offerings are not solely saturated in one area of the city, but that it is offered throughout and that there are um, an equal distribution of what we're trying to do across historically disadvantaged communities um, here in Los Angeles. So um, yeah, it starts with education. It starts with being able to put what was learned into practice and it kind of ends with a lifestyle change so that folks feel empowered, educate and equipped to be able to ask the right questions to their government officials and make the applicable, uh, appropriate changes that they want in their own communities as well. Thanks. Yeah. Marissa, Charlie, do you have any kind of unexpected benefits of keeping things local and handling a decent amount of material? I, I would say uh, a couple of things. Um, I want to say a little bit about the contamination. Contamination comes with every stream. Um, we are not haulers and we are not collectors. So that's on the Grow NYC. Uh, green market staff um, and, but, the island. And, and the island and all those all those collections are staffed um, so our material is is really also very clean and the larger the larger system in the city knows that uh, they're happy to be taking anything we can't take you know because of that and then on the on the equity side and in on the building uh, participation side I think it's become in the last couple of years really clear that having finished compost available when people drop off, they want to know they want to they want to get that benefit as soon as they can, right? And it becomes a great communications tool too. We're not we're not compost is not the bucket of food scrap. This is the compost here. This is what you can do with it. And knowing that everybody can get that just about any time they want it. Uh, I think it's become uh, a really important thing for the drop-off locations. But I wanted to go back to the contamination and uh, we we also go through on the island um, as we um, receive the material while the island is um, helping quite a lot by making sure that it's very clear in the licensing agreements, whether it's an event or it's a vendor or it's a tenant and that material is really clean and we we also we know where that material is coming from so we can tell um uh if somebody's not using a compostable straw but for the public facing piece it's a little bit harder and we're working with the island even though there's um a lot of signage there that says you're zero waste island even though um people um would like to participate we feel that the education still needs to be increased exponentially because uh people really they really just um, are, are want to be easy. It should be easy, and it's not easy. So we we want to applaud anyone who stops for a moment before they go to the source separation stations that are on the island. And we we definitely see that that work of education needs to be increased incredibly. That's a great segue into my next question, which is how can state and local governments help support operations that are scaling up? And it sounds like for contamination, one key piece is the outreach and education. 
Is there anything else that you guys, we have a pretty big audience of local government, state government here today. So I'd like to hear from each of you of, even if you've had some help and support from government in the past, what's something now that you think is really key for supporting scaling up local circular composting? And I'll pass it to JD first. Um, you know, so for my unique situation, um, acquiring the resident is my biggest problem. And I, I see municipalities as really being able to excel at reaching residents. Um, I've seen a lot of programs on the East Coast where the municipality uh, does a partnership with a community composter and participation does really increase at a faster rate. Um, I think there's a large demographic out there that isn't going to sign up until, you know, the city says, hey, you know, this is the program. I've found a lot of people who, you know, say, hey, you know, we need to take action on climate, we need to do all these things. You know, I tell them, hey, it's $15 a month, stop putting your food waste in the trash. And those people go, mm, no. You know, so like, I need those people to, to sign up here in Phoenix. Um, and I really feel like the only way they're going to is with municipalities saying, hey, you know, here's the program. Yeah, thanks. Michael? Yeah, to echo what JD said, I think municipalities and just city governments as a whole, legitimizing the work of community composters just goes a whole long way. And as soon as like <laughs> we're on the city's website or in a Green New Deal or any type of motion, like recognizing it as a collaborative partner versus like a competition that needs to be ignored um, is huge in this work. Um, even if we start to just grow into strong education and our lane is just like maybe part composting. I'd rather do one or two things very well and have the city back that and support that than for them to ignore it completely. Um, I think that there are many options to compost in LA from backyard, obviously food recovery, even before we get into composting. Backyard, community, and municipal are kind of like the three options. And um, the city is not doing the community. So we just want to do that really well. And we want to promote what they're doing really well and have it be a collaborative relationship versus one of competition and of isolation, essentially. Thanks. Okay, a closing question for all of you. I'd love to know what's next. You've all been uh, growing in scale, but maybe that's not necessarily what's in the future. Um, growth can look a lot of different ways. Um, JD, I'll start with you. If you could just briefly say what's next. I saw, I know your graph was steadily increasing that you showed. Is it going to continue that way or what's what's next for you? Uh, you know, you never know. Um, uh, the most promising thing is our ability to uh, reduce the cost of vegetables. So my model is really working. I started it because I wanted to be a farmer. And the biggest problem with small farming is selling. It's not growing it. It's selling it. You bring your stuff to the farmer's market. You sell half of what you bring there. You can't compete wholesale on price. Food service, there's consistency of menu and food costs. It's very difficult to be a successful small farmer. And then all the capital expenditures and stuff. Um, but, you know, my farmer is able to compete on wholesale now. I can sell a local bunch of kale at a lower price to the restaurant than Cisco can. Um, and I'm small. So that's what I'm most excited about because I, I think it can really work. That is exciting. And Michael, you've got your exciting park partnership landfill conversion anything else to yeah. add i think it's just solidifying the programs that we've been working so hard on and 
kind of establishing the blueprint and toolkits for others to follow it in LA and beyond. Um, personally, I just hope to kind of continue to get in seats and positions to help elevate the movement and ensure that resources can um, get to the appropriate party. So, um, yeah. Great, and Marissa and Charlie, any final word? You had a slide on this, but anything to add to that? Just continuing to work with all those stakeholders, all those people that are doing community composting would like to, and going back to that municipal, just hoping that the city can validate more smaller micro haulers, more smaller organizations that are doing this work, support it, if not financially with space and including the parks department, like having more and more people be involved in it and talking in, in doing the work, not just saying, oh, well, this should be happening and, you know, having green goals without really having any pith to what we know works, which is composting. Charlie? Uh, yeah, I, I said our, our capacity is way more than the island produces. Um, and we're we're moving into perhaps dealing with only what the island produces and being able to continue the work to the point where that island population and that community that we <clears throat> have been serving off the island actually here is, is here on the island. Great, well, thank you all for sharing your knowledge and experience with us today and also just for the wonderful work that you do every day. It's an inspiration I know to a lot of people out there, including me. Um, and to let everyone know, you will get a link to the recording. So you all have that. A survey will pop up at the end of this meeting, uh, just asking you a few questions about how it went. If you could fill that out, that would be great. And shout out, thank you to Brenda for being on the back end, helping us out today. And thank you everyone for joining. Have a great rest of your day. Bye.